Hi guys, that was a very accurate introduction. Um, I am the CEO of New Way Foods. Have you guys, have anybody heard of us before coming in? Nice, so we're a Bay Area startup. We just uh, approached our one year anniversary and we're looking at redefining seafood. So our tagline is, we disrupt seafood, not oceans. And today I hope to share with you a little bit about the past of fishing and what's happening now and what we're looking at for the future. Um, if you were in the previous social media talk, I could use all the help I can get in help promoting mm -hmm. New Way Foods. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at New Way Foods, take lots of pictures, hashtag share, and help promote us, which would be great. So I've been in love with the ocean ever since I could first remember, but I didn't have what you might think I would have as a growing up uh, a background. Like I'm not the daughter of a fishing family. I didn't grow up on the coast. I actually grew up in Las Vegas. <laughs> so um, not far from the ocean, close to the California coast, but I was definitely landlocked and stuck in the middle of the desert. And oftentimes the closest thing that I could get to the ocean were all-you-can-eat seafood buffets. And it was amazing to me growing up of the abundance of seafood in the middle of the desert. You were constantly surrounded by these mountains and mountains of seafood. All-you-can-eat uh, king crab snow lakes, all-you-can-eat shrimp, 99-cent shrimp cocktails. And I'm just always been amazed like how can we make that happen how can we find these precious resources that you have to get from thousands of miles away and make it this abundant thing in the middle of the ocean so what are the top two ways that we get seafood to our plates now anybody know so we fish it from the ocean right so we rely on the ocean the wild resource and where else and farming we have two sources Farming and fishing. That's it. So what's what I want to do now is not depress you guys too much because when I was getting my master's, I was learning a lot about the oceans and how we are overfishing through different types of fishing techniques. Uh, and I got really depressed <laughs> understanding that these pressures are happening now, they're happening very, very quickly, and a lot of our solutions aren't scaling to meet the exponential problems that we're experiencing. So I thought we could do an activity to get a sense of what what's happening in the ocean with different species. Are you guys up for it? Okay. So just like me growing up in Las Vegas, people often have this perception that seafood is bountyless. We have an un... Um, you know, an unending resource in the ocean. We can just continue to harvest all the time. And even if you walk outside, there's some cool uh, seafood or ocean-inspired pieces of art. And that one of tuna was saying that we, we harvest over 20,500 pounds of tuna every 15 minutes from the ocean. So if you think that's happening all the time consistently, all this extraction is really starting to add up. So what we're going to do today uh, is be a population of fish. So I'm going to pass around these cards, and everyone should take one. So you're going to get either a yellow, a blue, a pink, or a green. So just take one and pass it around. And this was a really fun game that I found. Um, I should give credit. It's from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. It's a government uh, organization. They created this to help really people understand and grasp what's happening in the oceans because it's so hard. Like when I was in school, it's like, Mom, we're learning about fisheries and what's happening and are you being over harvested? And she's like, what's a fishery? You know? <laughs> so people have a hard time grasping this magnitude of the oceans and um, different populations and how do we monitor them. So when everybody has a card, stand up, and then I want everyone to be an arm's length away from each other. We won't be moving around too much. I know it's kind of warm. 
So now we're a bunch of fish in the sea. We're all one population. We can say that we're tuna, right? So we're tuna in the ocean, and this ball represents life. So what I'm going to do is just have you guys pass this around to, to each other, across the room, and you can get started. So just continually pass it around. And here we have life going through the ocean. We have um, mating happening. We have feeding happening. You're protecting yourself from other fish uh, predating on you. So this is what's happening when you have a nice, healthy population. If you're just walking in, uh, try to find a colored note card. <laughs> and we're, printed, we're, we're all tuna in the sea right now. Or we'll scare some people away. Okay, so we're humming and we're buzzing and life is going well. Our population is thriving. Um, and then we're going to start out like in the very early days of fishing, which people call now artisanal fishermen. It's usually small boats, maybe one or two people on the boat, and they're often fishing with a line. Just a reel and rod, one line. So keep passing the ball around. Our population's thriving, and now we have our artisanal fisherman. He's come above us, and he's starting to fish. So if you ended up with a pink card, sit down. You've been fished, and you're out. So if you have a pink card, our artisanal fisherman caught you. <laughs> <laughs> and the ball should keep going. So is everybody with a pink card sat down? Okay. Not that much of an effect, right? We can still pass the ball around easily. You guys can see each other. Food's being eaten. Population's still thriving. Artisanal fishermen often don't have that much of an impact to negatively impact a population. So as the ball keeps going, we're going through time, and what happens? Technology, <laughs> yeah, technology improves. So now people are thinking like, uh, okay, fish is good. How this is like a really um, hard way to keep fish fresh. It's a lot of coastal communities that really only has have access to fresh fish. But how am I going to save fish for long periods of time? How am I going to distribute fish? Refrigeration, right? So we get bigger boats and we improve in technology and things like refrigeration. So now we have a slightly bigger fishing vessel, there's more people on the boat, maybe you have a net instead of a line which can catch more at a time. And if you have, let me just see here, okay, so now we've transitioned, right, we have more people fishing out and if you had a blue card, sit down. So the ball should still keep going. But what's different now? It's a little harder to pass the ball from one side to the next. <laughs> and so now we're extracting more fish because we have this technology, we can keep it refrigerated. It's not limited to just coastal communities and small artisanal fisheries. Um, now we're moving into more present day um, situations where scientists have learned that high, uh, diets with high in fish are very healthy for you. So it's popular to consume fish, um, the demand is increasing, technology is improving, there's sonar and radar and we can track these populations, the vessels are getting bigger and your nets are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we're extracting these huge amounts of fish from the sea every day. So as the ball keeps going around, uh, think about like this picture here, this giant net of fish is like, being extracted from our oceans right now. Now they're targeting one species, but do you think if you scoop a net through a column of water, are you just going to magically get all the ones that you want and the other fish are going to say, peace, no, I'm not a tuna? It often results in a lot of extra animals that are caught too. So keep passing the ball around. Now we have our extra large fishing vessel coming out with an extra large net. And if you have a yellow card, sit down.
So anybody who has a green card will be the only people left. And keep to tossing the ball around. So green, green team, what do you guys notice between now and when we first started? How hard is it to get the ball to the next person? <laughs> it's harder, right? Sometimes it doesn't make it. Sometimes you may not be able to connect with another fish to mate, or you may not be able to find another fish to feed. You might have small populations tucked around, but it would be harder for you to connect with the other tuna across the room. Um, so thank you guys. You can sit down if you want. <laughs> So I hope that gives you a sense of like really what the magnitude of, is happening. And I want you guys to help me answer some questions. So thinking about where we started, we're all standing up, and now our populations are down just to a few green cards or a few tuna left. What do you think would happen if a disease broke out with our population? It can really damage it, right? It'd be hard to come back from it. And even though the fish are still present, it's overfished because it's going to take a long time, if at all, for them to rebound, for them to repopulate and bounce back to our artisanal fishery days. What do you think would happen if like an oil spill occurred and we had this diminished population? What do you think would happen if an oil spill occurred? Or other natural disaster, well, that's not a natural disaster, but a natural disaster comes through, or some other uh, climate change things that the oceans are facing. Are you familiar with any of those? Extinction, Extinction can happen, right? Think about uh, the increase in temperature, and juvenile fish are really, really sensitive to those fine parameters. So if we had a few juvenile tuna and our temperatures were too warm, they may not be able to reach that next level of maturity to mate, and then now we're still not uh, adding populations or adding fish to our population. And then I guess, what do you think would happen if we kept fishing this way? Collapse. Right. So most of our fisheries in the ocean have collapsed or on the brink of collapse. We've over-harvested and overfished them. It's not a sustainable way to view our oceans. There's many examples from Atlantic cod to tuna that are on the brink of extinction right now. But it's not just ecosystems and the oceans that suffer. It's the coastal communities and people that live in the fishery community that suffer. People will lose their jobs and their incomes. And it's just a snowball effect. And we really rely on these, these ecosystems to support us in many other ways, too. So, you know, just what we're talking about, what are some of the effects of overfishing? It impacts the ecosystems. It impacts uh, humans and the livelihoods of people involved in fishing communities. And it impacts our future. Uh, you know, you can't rely on biodiversity if you're taking out lots of animals and different species. It's all interconnected. And what we're doing right now isn't sustainable. Here's an example of another impact of overfishing. Like I mentioned, those large, large nets um, are targeting tuna, for example. They really only want that one species, but a net doesn't discriminate and you get a lot of other animals caught in the net. So this is an example of bycatch from shrimp. Um, with New Way Foods, our first target is replacing shrimp. And because it embodies a lot of these really, really negative sides of fishing, especially on uh, uh, wild caught and farm raised. So this is an example of bycatch that came from the Gulf of uh, California, so right between Mexico and Baja. And you can see from a shrimp fishery net, you usually get upwards of 10 to 15 pounds of other animals to one pound of shrimp. That gets thrown away, they often die, and their populations are impacted as well. Um, I learned about this little marine mammal here when I was in school at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Does anybody know who he is? Yeah, Vaquita. He, he's very cute. He's the smallest marine mammal uh, known to man. And they're very discreet. They only live in the Gulf of California. And can anybody guess how many are left today? Yeah, it's less than 60 because we were so intensely fishing the Gulf of California for shrimp and a few other fish species. Uh, these guys get caught in the net and they're marine mammals, so they need to come up to breathe. They get stuck, they can't breathe, and then they're 
they're basically gone. Um, so their, threat, their populations are extremely threatened, and if we continue to fish that way in the Gulf of California, they'll most likely be extinct. Scientists are estimating between the next 10 and 15 years. So why, why, why is this important? And we identified that there's really two ways that we're getting seafood right now. We're looking at the gray, which is wild caught, and we just went through how we're really maxed out on how we can wild catch fish from the wild because we've exhausted a lot of the resources, the populations aren't bouncing back, but the demand is continuing to soar, so we're supplementing with farmed. So right now it's about 50-50, we get half from the wild, half from farmed, but to meet a growing demand to feed 10 billion people, uh, we're going to have to really amp up the farming. But farming isn't exactly a win-win scenario. So if we look, now it's amazing to me that farmed fish is actually, consumption of farmed fish has actually uh, exceeded consumption of beef globally. So more people are eating fish protein than there are beef protein. Uh, I believe it's somewhere between like 20 pounds of farmed fish to around 15 pounds of beef per person per year globally. But there's a lot of problems with farming. So if we just look at shrimp, there's a lot of fish that are being farmed, but shrimp is the number one. So number one, consume seafood in the U.S., and we import 90% of what we consume from farms, especially in Asia and India. Um, so it's not always the healthiest option. They're usually crammed into small spaces where they are intensely uh, packed, so you have a lot of animals in a confined space that require antibiotics and other chemicals to manage disease outbreak. Um, there's not a lot of regula regulations. Uh, enforcing the quality of input to these farms, so they're often downstream from pig farms. And uh, all of that gets shipped over to us. So the FDA is supposed to be inspecting our shrimp imports, but really only about 2% actually get sampled. And there's been a lot of studies out there that any shrimp that you buy from Walmart to Whole Foods can be contaminated with these illegal antibiotics and other undesirable things. So it's not necessarily healthy for us. It's even driving a uh, a really sad practice of human slavery and processing the amount of shrimp that's coming out of these farms. Uh, the Associated Press just won a Pulitzer Peace Prize Award for their expose on uh, slavery being used in shrimp and other fish farms, especially in Asia. So this demand, this 99 cent shrimp cocktail that my friends and I would see all the time in Las Vegas comes at a real cost. It's not that there's just a bunch of shrimp in this sea and we can take them out. We're actually destroying our environment and forcing children into slavery to have a taco or to have something that's just so fleeting. So that's why I think we need a new solution and that's why I started New Wave Foods. I don't think we can really rely on these two sources. Obviously our oceans are getting exhausted, fish farming, Sounds great, but we need a lot of improvement. And for, in order for it to scale at a rate that would match the demand, it sounds like the environmental and social injustice and health problems just will increase instead of decrease. So that's why I started New Way Foods to create plant and algae-inspired seafood. And we're targeting shrimp because it is the number one consumed seafood in the US, but there's no real alternative out there that delivers on taste, texture, and nutrition. And when we started to think about this concept, we obviously wanted to use ingredients that were less resource intensive and abundant. So naturally we thought of plants, but then we were thinking about what are the building blocks of seafood? What builds them? And algae came to mind and it just makes sense. Algae actually contributes to shrimp uh, in a variety of ways. They eat their bottom feeders, so they eat a lot of things, but a lot of it is microalgae. The color comes from microalgae. Uh, their flavor can come from microalgae. So why can't we use those same ingredients and recreate the culinary experience of shrimp? And that's what we're doing. So this is our first product. We're calling it Pop Shrimp. It's like popcorn inspired, popcorn shrimp inspired product. Um, and it, it looks, this is it. So this is a picture of it. Um, we will have it breaded and fried, so it's thermally stable. And it really delivers on all those great things, texture, taste, and nutrition. Um, people often have shellfish allergies they develop later in life. Ours are shellfish allergen free, so they can eat it. Vegans can eat it. It's completely plant and algae based. And interestingly, uh, other markets open up for this now. Like, I wasn't even thinking about this, but when I was working at our offices about a year ago, 
three rabbis walked in, and the next thing I know, we have a kosher product on our hands. So shellfish isn't really kosher, but because it's made of plants and algae, it can be certified kosher when we have uh, enough scale. So interestingly enough, we can create something that gives you that same culinary experience without the negative impacts. And another exciting thing about algae, I think, is now it's becoming more uh, more common in our food system. So a lot of times people will say, oh, algae, that sounds gross. It sounds like pond scum. But it's actually a very common ingredient. Like most of us have probably eaten algae in the past week and we didn't know. Uh, and the carbon footprint of producing algae can be much, much smaller than that even of plant-based uh, ingredients. So soy crops or pea protein crops, those sorts of things require a lot of land space, water, um, and those sorts of resources. Microalgae especially can be cultivated in a very, very small factory and usually downstream from other, other facilities. So you can use, um, like for example, there's one in Brazil that is next to a sugarcane factory and they can use the waste stream from the sugarcane to feed and grow their algae. So now you even have more of a closed loop system. And it's interesting, like one of my favorite new companies is Terravia. Have you guys tried their algae oil? <laughs> it's really good. Um, but they often cite the fact that algae came before plants, so it's really the mother of all food. And it just makes sense for us to go back to that level of solid nu nutrients that are easily abundantly regenerated. So that's the inspiration for what we're doing here. Um, we, we're just a startup, like I said, but if you have any questions, I'd love to share them with you, and I hope that gave you some insights to what has happened into seafood and what we're trying to go for now.